that's just what we do Light them up, drink them down Whiskey and cigars all around Cheers, y'all. Well, 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 well. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this fine little radio program known internationally as Smoking and Toasting. We are all about craft beer, fine spirits, and hand-rolled cigars. We'll talk about all of those things today as we welcome you to show number 162. And we'll tell you all about what's uh, happening on the show today in just a moment. But first, we are brought to you by B&B Butchers and Restaurant, 1814 Washington Ave in Houston, at the Shops in Clear Fork in Fort Worth, uh, by BB Italia on Memorial in Houston, BB Lemon on Washington Ave, and the Annie Cafe and Bar on Post Oak in Houston, now open and rocking it. So uh, we are uh, we are thrilled to be a, uh, a, a program sponsored by those guys because they just, well, the bars are incredible. And they make the best bacon. You know, in Cruz, the world. your your intro, well, well, yes, you got a little bit of the whiskey voice going on. Oh today. well, I do. That's because B and B is where we were last night. We That's were right. up on the uh, on the back patio there as we did the second annual smoking and toasting whiskey sniff at B and B Butchers and Restaurant. Man, that was and, a lot of fun. Uh, boy, there was there was whiskey everywhere. Uh, we even discovered a little rum and tequila before the night was over, mm-hmm. and uh, we were pairing it with cigars. It was a wonderful evening, and thank you. Huge thanks to everybody that came out, everybody that bought tickets and made the uh, second annual uh, Whiskey Sniff a huge success. It's in the books now, and we're already talking about uh, what to do for year number three. The third annual Whiskey Sniff. i got to tell you, I I was so surprised and so delighted to see there were uh, quite a few people that were there last year that came Mm -hmm. up and said, hey, man, we saw the... uh, we saw the notification. You guys were doing it again. We bought tickets immediately. That was so fun. So you feel like if if you throw a party and people come, and then you throw the next one and people come the second time, that you, you must have done there's, okay. There's something good about yeah, that. Something right, good right? about. And there was a lot good actually. There was, <laughs> there was just. And plus, did you get a chance to uh, like eat any of the hors d'oeuvres that were being passed around? I don't think a B&B? plate of the bacon passed by without me at least oh, nabbing a little bit. My it was God. So good, so good. And those uh, the little corn dog things. Oh, oh man, God. yeah, it was just amazing. And the what was the little uh, the beef Wellington? The beef in, miniature in a, beef Wellingtons. Oh, are you kidding those me? Are, yeah, like yeah, that's just so crazy. It was it was all just delicious, and uh, and I got to try tons of different whiskeys I'd never tried before, and so um, I'm just I'm just absolutely stoked. Some of my uh, some of my friends showed up, and I had to laugh because. Uh, uh, Right after everything was done, and I tore everything down, I went downstairs, and of course, there's a whole bunch of people that were upstairs for the for the whiskey sniff that were downstairs now eating. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now it's time for exactly. a big old steak. Now you would think, and if this were, let's just say, a lesser show, this might be the case. You would think that after the whiskey sniff, and you and I put away some whiskey samples last night. We did. Yes. We did. Uh, no, no, uh, no getting away from that. You would think after that, the last thing we would do. Is come on today's show, and do a, a whiskey tasting. Well, see, we're not like that. Yeah, no, that we're t- not that, like that at all. We're, we, we're, we don't roll like we're that. We're professionals. That's right. Last we, night was practice. We take our job very seriously, <laughs> and uh, so we're here to take it seriously today with uh, Jack Ferris from Bushmills, Woo. who is uh, in the studio with us. Jack, welcome. Well, cheers. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks. So we're, we'll talk a lot about Bushmills. I have a lot of questions, and uh, I also see you. Well, just what you've got out here is one, two, three. Four, five, six, um, six expressions. Six expressions of Bushmills. So, really excited to talk about this and ask you lots of questions. I also see a lot of the. I think of them as props, but these are real, actual things. You know, the staves and the uh, the samples of how the uh, how the whiskey looks in its raw form, right? Oh yeah. And so, so we'll be talking a lot about that as the program goes on today. Uh, plus, on today's show, is Heineken better than craft beer? There's reason to think it could be, and I will be asking you, Ian, you know what I should have done? I should have gone and gotten a Heineken for us to taste on the show today. I actually kind of intended to, and I forgot about it, because I knew this was something that we'd be I'm discussing gonna, on the program. So I, I'm going to, well, I'll talk about it when we talk about the Heineken, okay. but I have a little Heineken story. Okay, perfect. To, to I love part. 
I love my. You, most people tell me I have a tequila story because pretty much everybody does have a tequila story. <laughs> oh, I have story. I have a few of those. Yeah, actually. yeah. But if you, you, you have think a, after my first one that I wouldn't have any more tequila, oh, I have one tequila story. Oh no, no. I am tenacious, if nothing else. Again, here we are <laughs> after the whiskey sniff, tasting whiskey. This is what we do. So right. <laughs> so it feels pretty good. So. Uh, so there's uh, going to be uh, quite a bit of Bushmills tasting on the program today. Plus, we have some uh, very interesting craft beers, I think, on today's program. St. Arnold's Guten Tag, their Belgian-style lager, is uh, out. It's been out for about a uh, month and a half, two I've months, I've seen I it think. for a yes. while. I hadn't tried it yet. <laughs> but, so that'll uh, be interesting. We'll be trying that on the show today. And then a brewery that we love, Ecliptic Brewing has teamed up with another brewery that we love, Bells. Bells. And they have put together an IPA. It's called Five Years, Five Beers. Apparently, they've done this collaboration uh, you know, every year for five years now. Uh, so this is a juicy IPA. So we'll be looking forward to trying that on the program. And then, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at this word real closely to try to pronounce it correctly. Uh, Kunhin Brewing. It's K-U-H-N. H E N N. I don't know if you pronounce the second H though. Yeah. Kunin. Kunin. Kunin? I bet it's Kunin. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I bet it's Kunin. Uh, Kunin I'm just Brewing. guessing here, but if you're from the brewery watching this, yeah, um, please, call us. please, call, uh, or or just you know <laughs> or, t- uh, yeah. comment on the uh, on, some kind on of phonetic thing with in the, the phonetic comments, thing. We'll yes. figure it out. Uh, so Kunin has made a uh, an imperial white ale called White Devil, and this would be a first on the show because we generally try to do the beers in ascending order of you know, like how the big style, the, the right, style right, right. and the and the, uh, and the uh, ABV and the uh, uh, the Coonan Brewing White Devil is a white ale, but it will be our final beer at nine percent. So, yeah, a, a, an Imperial White Ale. So I don't know. I don't think That's I've ever had an Imperial White. Right. Before. I don't know that I have either. So uh, so that'll be something to look forward to. Uh, plus, uh, new uh, a new little uh, article released: the top full-bodied cigars in the world. We'll try to share that with you. And the best uh, are they all LFDs? The, uh, well, I thought about that. In <laughs> fact, I'm going to talk about LFD here in a few minutes. But first, I should probably ask you, Ian. It's been a, a crazy week. I know you've smoked cigars because I saw you last uh, last night at the uh, whiskey sniff. But Man, did you smoke anything interesting? Last that you night, share? I managed to pull down three cigars, dude, and it was awesome. Yeah, you know. Uh, I just I just want a, a little aside on last night is we got everything set up and ready to go and mm-hmm. we didn't have much maintenance after that except for hanging out with everybody so which it was, was the really best part. pretty relaxed yes. the yeah. best part yes so I got up this morning and I went up by uh, Casa de Monte Cristo my normal morning thing chilled out a little bit and I selected a Rocky Patel um, ALR second edition oh this is, ALR this is, is a fairly new release isn't it yes yeah. it's a very new release uh, and ALR is aged limited and rare yes and this is their second edition so the second year they've done it um, so the 2019 version of this mm-hmm. this has a uh, it's a beautiful wow, that, uh, presentation on just, it yeah, yeah if you just look at the band beautiful. on that that's gorgeous it's yeah. got the band it's got the big sleeve that covers almost the entire cigar which I don't know why they did because the cigar when you pull the sleeve off is also beautiful mm-hmm. so so uh, uh, the cigar itself. Let's start with. Let's start from the top. This is a robusto. It's a five point five by fifty two, San Andreas wrapper, uh, Hunter and Nicaraguan filler, Hunter and binder. Um, and the appearance on this beautiful band sleeve, mostly smooth and leathery. Once you take that sleeve off, medium to dark brown, firm box press on mm-hmm. it. You can see pretty much all that. Also, uh, I took a picture of how the uh, how it punched because it punched so clean and so I was neat. Say, like, it's one of the coolest looking punch yeah. uh, openings I've ever seen. <laughs> I was like, that's, that's awesome. great. You know, the, uh, yeah. sometimes the cap can be a little dry and it'll. Crack It'll a little crack bit, a little bit no, yep. that, that one punched in just the most beautiful way. I love it. The pre-light sniff on this, uh, chocolatey, pleasant spice, hint of earth and leather on mm-hmm. it. Not a real strong smelling cigar before you light it. The pre-light draw, I used the punch, obviously you can see that. Uh, light effort to the draw, so very little effort. You know, not effortless, but you know. Uh, light effort. Uh, there's a little leather in the, in the flavor there, a little fruit, a little earth. Chocolate was still there. Leather and spice on the lips was interesting because the, it really left uh, it really left that flavor on your lips mm-hmm. uh, for the uh, the wrapper did. The initial light on this uh, leather and pepper with some spice, hint of bitter chocolate in the background. It wasn't a pepper bomb on the light. Uh, it was it was more of a leather bomb, as weird as that may sound. Mm-hmm. And it was really nice because it didn't you know hit you like a brick. Uh, this cigar came in by the way. I forgot to write this down, but this cigar came in at about a medium. Uh, I would say overall, 
And I had coffee with it, so the coffee might have imparted some coffee flavors as well. Uh, the first third of this, pepper and spice settle in a little bit. Bitter chocolate was was really prevalent, and coffee was uh, backing that up with a bit of earth and fruit in the background. Solid ash, perfect burn on this thing. And every picture you see, the burn is perfect. I never tended it once. It was just like a laser all the way down the cigar. It was very awesome. nice. Construction was fantastic. Second third of this cigar, more bitter chocolate, moved right up to the front. There was a little sweet creaminess that happens, and the fruity flavors kind of rounded it out uh, with spice and pepper on the finish, which was really nice. So it, it kind of evolved and flipped around from where it started, which was really interesting. And I love a cigar that uh, that develops like this, where the flavors start doing more interesting things. Now, it didn't really get a whole lot of new flavors going on, which can also happen in a cigar, but they really did move around in the palate a little bit, which is really nice. When I got to the last third of this cigar, the sweetness ramped up a little bit, which was a little strange because you'd usually think the pepper ramps up right? because they load up a little bit. The sweetness ramped up a little bit. Chocolate got some oak notes showing up on the end of this, which was really nice. Leather and earth were still there. The fruity flavor and pepper in the background was really nice. Solid ash, perfect burn. I timed this smoke. I thought that might be an interesting thing to add to my reviews. Like how long? It, exactly uh... an hour. Huh? Very cool. Like one hour on the dot. On the nose. I love it. I love <laughs> you it. Know, I'm not a super fast smoker. Some people smoke faster than me, but that cigar was right at an hour, which was a pretty long smoke for a five and a half by 52, mm -hmm. I thought. And that, I kind of like that about it. Uh, the price to quality uh, index, uh, this was a $13 cigar, so it's a little expensive. That's a super premium yeah, in my yeah, book. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I enjoyed everything about it. It gets a solid five. Nice. Um, I, I, just due to the price, I can't. Uh, can't give it much more than five because right. it was an expensive cigar. But, frankly, you get everything you're paying for, and it was a fantastic cigar. I will buy those again. The price to quality, for those of you who don't know, uh, our price to quality index is we have a scale of one to ten. And what happens is um, five, you get exactly what you pay for. Mm -hmm. If you get above five, you're punching above your weight class there. Your, your, your uh, cigar was better than what you paid, and if you get below five, Maybe you paid a little too much yeah, for that quality of the yeah. cigar. That's, It'd that's still be good, but maybe it was overpriced, or you know what I mean? Uh, right, it, right. It just depends. Like, there's been a lot of really, really great cigars that have not rated higher than a five, simply because yeah, I feel like feel like you got what you paid for, and if that had been a couple of bucks more, you'd have felt like maybe it was overpriced. Right. You know? I mean, so, if this if this same cigar was a nine dollar cigar. It would have gotten way above a five, right? But at exactly. thirteen dollars, you're definitely paying for it, but you're definitely getting what. But as long as you, hey, as long as you're getting what you paid for. What uh, are you talking about today? Well, I uh, uh, got an invitation to join my friend Ian at uh, okay, Casa crazy. de Monte Cristo. Yeah, and I thought, well, I haven't seen enough of you in the past uh, twenty four hours, That's so right. let's uh, <laughs> so let's spend a little more time together. So uh, I came and joined you at Casa de Monte Cristo, and I went to the humidor thinking, okay, I I'm not going to try to do something crazy. I'm just going to like get. Something maybe that I haven't smoked in a while, and I went down the aisle with the Lafleur Dominicanas, mm -hmm. and I thought I haven't smoked one of these in a long time. They are always beautiful. They're too. They're always gorgeous. You know, they've got that. They've got that big power. I thought, yeah, I can. After everything, you know, last night and stuff, I can handle a big cigar today. Uh, so I kind of seized. My eyes was sort of drawn to this beautiful torpedo that was a uh, Maduro. It was the Suave. The La Flor Dominicana Suave. Suave. Uh, beautiful, nice chocolate brown color. Uh, so that's what I got. They clipped it for me. It's a torpedo. Uh, I lit it up nice and easy. The pre-light, though, before I uh, put the flame to it, was kind of chocolatey, just like the color. Mm -hmm. uh, some nice earth, a little bit of that light grassiness. And um, I was thinking, well, this is going to be another one of those real full-bodied La Flor Dominicanas. And uh, that was only because I didn't do my homework. The Suave line, I found out once I sat down and started poking around on the iPad, the Suave line is the original La Flor Dominicana line oh. before they started coming out with these like the nature powerhouses. beaters. The powerhouses, right, right. Houses, right. So I was like, okay, well, uh, you know, these are all Dominican. They're all lighter bodied. The... Uh, That'll be that'll be an interesting thing to smoke here this morning. So wasn't what I was thinking I was getting into, but uh, I, I was ready for it, no problem. So first half of the cigar, uh, it it lights up. Um, I'm I'm thinking this is medium bodied, maybe on the lighter side of medium, and that the um, the natural on this because I had the Maduro. I said I'm thinking yeah, the natural's probably 
like a full on mild, you know, mm-hmm. probably not even quite as uh, as bold as this is. But it started out really nice, um, fairly mild, nice lighter tobacco flavors, some nuttiness, a little bit of the sweetness from the Maduro mm-hmm. tobacco. Then I hit the second half of this thing, and it started to ramp up both in intensity and in flavor. I mean, it totally surprised me. I did not see this coming. And I was starting to get earth and chocolate, less of the milder tobacco grassiness that was in it uh, earlier, and definitely more oomph. The first half, I would say, was on the milder side of medium. Part two was definitely medium, even like medium to full in terms of the intensity. And I really, really loved it. I particularly loved the second half uh, because that is just kind of like right to my palate. Medium to full is kind of my sweet spot, you know. Uh, So it's about a $9 cigar. I did enjoy the change up, you know, the fact that it went from one uh, strength to another. Uh, but the second half was definitely more interesting. Um, Nine dollar cigar, price to quality, I will give it a five. It's definitely worth it. Uh, it, you know, it. it uh, I was glad it wasn't a thirteen dollar cigar, mm-hmm. but uh, but yeah, at nine, I, I, I would buy that again for sure. I so. just I just want everyone to make sure that they have the visual of us reviewing cigars together, right next to each other. Yeah. So we sit there and stare at each other while we're puffing cigars, and then we furiously write things on our iPad and don't tell each other what we're no. what we're uh, experiencing, no, no, which is. Kind yeah. of interesting. <laughs> it didn't really look like that, but in my mind, that's that's kind of a funny. Visual. Well, I like it better. I like the version in your mind a little better. So, okay, Bushmills Irish whiskey. We're going to get into this in just a few moments. Plus, we'll start a little beer tasting, and we're going to have Jack Ferris tell us about what I believe to be. And correct me if I'm wrong on this. Is is the Bushmills Distillery the oldest whiskey distillery in the world? World's oldest licensed. Okay, so, that that yeah. qualifies. That so, qualifies. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I'm gonna. Uh, we have some questions about that for you, and of course we'll uh, begin the tasting here coming up in our uh, uh, second segment. It's show number 162, tasting Bushmills plus is Heineken better than craft beer? We'll get to that coming up. It's smoking and toasting. Welcome back. It's smoking and toasting. This program is all about craft beer, fine spirits, and hand rolled cigars. It's show number one hundred and sixty-two. Jack Ferris from uh, Bushmills is in the studio with us today, and we are brought to you by B and B Butchers and Restaurant at eighteen fourteen Washington Ave in Houston, in the shops at Clear Fork in Fort Worth, and all of the various the various other B B B and B establishments uh, across uh, our fair city here in Houston. Of course, we're heard all over the world. Uh, but our sponsors here in Houston, and we like to give them as big uh, props as we as we can. Well, here in Houston and in, in Fort Worth. But trust me, they're taking over the world. They'll they'll be out there soon, coming yeah. to where you are. So when I went downstairs last night, a couple of the guys were uh, sitting down there, just about ready to order. Yeah, and they look at me. They go, "Do you recommend anything?" I said, "Start with bacon." Yeah, and it's all and just work your way through. It's the all menu. good after yeah. that. It doesn't just matter work what your way you through the menu. That. Start with bacon. Yeah, yeah. They they truly have the bacon is a life changing uh, experience. If you've, if you've never been there, I don't know if you're a fan of bacon. Oh yeah, it's okay. like this thick, mm-hmm. and which doesn't seem to me like it'd be something I would like. <laughs> Bef- when I tried it for the first time, I was really dubious because. I like crisp, you know, almost yeah, overcooked chef. bacon. This is the Chef Tommy oh, bacon. It's oh. like this thick. It's like a quarter inch thick, and then it's drizzled with truffle oil and blue cheese, and it's so yeah, it's amazingly just amazingly good. It's, like, it's, I don't even know how it's, it's habit yeah. forming. L- it, it's, it's, listen, listen to you guys talk. <laughs> like in that first segment, my mouth is just watering. Uh, see? All right, well, that's <laughs> so, good. Yeah, that's good. We we have a similar response when somebody lines out six of their whiskeys yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, for us. So uh, Jack Ferris is here. Jack is uh, from Bush Mills. You're a brand ambassador, correct? Brown ambassador. What exactly are the qualifications to become a brand ambassador? Because I know what you would have to be qualified to do in order to be a distiller. But what does a brand ambassador have to be able to do? So I'm actually a little bit of a square peg for a round hole because I'm not your standard brand ambassador. uh, Because I was actually born and raised only five miles from that distillery. Okay. And I spent seven years working in the distillery. Ah. So I even started off working on the bottling lines. Okay. Whenever, weirdly, I didn't actually have an interest in whiskey whatsoever. It was just a job. It was it was a job. Summertime, college job. You know, mm-hmm. I'm taking bottles off the line, put them in, into the cardboard tubes. You're making sure that the box is going off well. You know, easy job. Great money. You know, summertime job. What more right. could you ask sure. for? But um, 
as I like the more I was at the distillery, the more I learned, and the more I learned, the more I wanted to express, and the more I wanted to express, the more I wanted to learn. So it was this vicious circle. Mm-hmm. So I got involved within the maturation department, worked very closely with all the distillers, um, worked within customs and excise, worked with the bonded. I worked with every single person in that distillery. Wow. Um, so over those seven years, I got immersed in everything you could imagine, which unfortunately means I'm not your standard brand ambassador. Right. I mean, the biggest thing you need to be a brand ambassador is that you can talk to people and mm-hmm. you can actually believe in what you're talking about. Sure, it requires a certain amount of like, I, I dig this and I want to share it with mm-hmm. you. Yeah. You have to yeah. have some passion for it, right? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And it's like even just finding some kind of notch of mm-hmm. the of the entire bigger picture. If you find that little notch you're passionate about, everyone's going to see that and everyone's going to listen. And it's also to have a good story. I mean, if you don't have a good story or you don't have a story of exactly how you're connected to this product, well, no one's going to give you any time. Well, one of the things that, you know, we've been able to discover is we've, you know, spent time doing this program and Ian's certainly got uh, a much longer and more rich history with with uh, uh, with whiskey than I do. If you mean by sampling it aplenty, yes. Yes, that's, that's what I'm yes. talking about, yeah. But, uh, but one of the things that I've discovered is that the more I've learned about it, and the more of these stories that I have been able to uh, to hear and, and read about, the more, not just the more interesting it is, but the more I can like actually have real appreciation for what it is that I'm tasting, for what I'm drinking. It it really kind of comes with, and it's the same for other spirits too, for tequila, it's, for rum, for, it's the same for beers. for everything. Yeah. Steve Ray Vaughan's guitar is much more interesting than a brand new guitar. Right. It's Just, got stories. It's right, got yeah. Right. It's got character, and yeah. that makes a big difference. Yeah, like across the board, no matter what you're doing. Well, uh, it's interesting to me that you spent what seven years in the distillery, and then you kind of hit the road telling people about what was going on at the distillery. So yeah. Uh, so how do you uh, do? You like this side of it? Is this is this oh, fun for you? Yeah. Like I, I've always loved talking to people. I've always loved sharing my passion because. Before I left the distillery, I was running the bar within Bushmills Distillery itself because we take about 120,000 uh, tours of the distillery every mm-hmm. single year. And it's at least double that, if not triple, of people just coming directly into the bar. So we've got novices coming into the bar. We've got a lot of uh, college kids coming over as mm-hmm. well during the summertime. Sure. And most of them will come up and say, I don't like whiskey. And they're standing at the Bushmills Distillery bar. So it's my job to figure out a way, how do I get them to enjoy a style of whiskey. Right. How can we relate it to them? So it was also by that, particularly last year, of like figuring out how do I get someone engaged into whiskey that is already coming up. The first thing they've said to me is not the hello. First thing, yeah, right. Is just going, I don't like whiskey. I, I don't like whiskey. And you're like, <laughs> it's, it's, instead of standing there being flummoxed, it's like, how do I gauge, how do I get something to intrigue them? How right. do I get something to pull them in? Right, right. So by doing that, I've gained up so much more of a passion. It's like sharing the story of Bushmills and converting people over to great Irish whiskey. Right. So, so. so let me ask you the, about Irish whiskey because while you could make an argument that every style of whiskey is surging right now, that you know, whiskey is going through a real sort of renaissance in popularity, but it seems like in particular Irish whiskey is really kind of stealing the spotlight. What do you attribute that to? I think it's just, I think we can actually connect this even down to craft beer. Yeah. Uh, because what, 10 to 15 years ago, we only had the big boys. Sure. That were, you know, all, you know, everyone just knew the standard. Mm-hmm. And then people started to want to know what is in there that I'm. What's in my beer? You know, yeah. What's in my beer? And then also, what's in my food? So all of a sudden, we're starting to see more organic food coming up. We're starting right. to see more shows explaining exactly what this is. And I think it just took whiskey that little bit more time. Once people became more and more engaged and more and more knowledgeable about exactly what beer is, what you know IPA is, can you compare it to an imperial stout? And that it's almost becoming standard knowledge to people who frequent bars, you know, a couple times right. a week. Sure, sure that makes sense. And that's across all demographics. I mean we're not just talking to a male demographic. I mean, we go to a bar any time now. I mean mm-hmm. you're talking fifty, if not a third of the bar is the female demographic and everyone's drinking a different style of beer. Right. And they know what it is. And I think Irish whiskey just over the last couple of years this is where that engagement's coming in, that there's more to whiskey than scotch and bourbon. Can you, can you break down the difference between what makes Irish whiskey Irish whiskey? Because I think a lot Other of people know that, there's, from. Yeah. know that there's Irish whiskey, but it's not just that it's Irish. Yeah, like you've got a key criteria, and then you've got a regional difference. So the right. key criteria 
is the fact it must be distilled, matured, and bottled within Ireland. Right. Okay. Uh, so we cannot use anything else from outside. If it's going to be a single malt, it all must be done under one roof. Mm -hmm. So if we bring together two single malts together, that's going to be not a pure single malt. Right. But the regional difference, when people ask me, what is the difference between Irish and Scottish whiskey, for example? Mm -hmm. Now, these are regional differences. It doesn't mean everyone has to follow these. So typically, an Irish whiskey is triple distilled. And what that typically means is that it's smoother mm -hmm. in comparison to a Scottish style, which is generically double distilled. Right. Now, again, there's exceptions to every rule, but these are minor exceptions. Mm -hmm. Sure. And then the other big difference is the fact with Irish whiskey, typically we only dry out our raw ingredients, in our case, malted barley, using hot, clean, fresh air. So there's no impurities in there whatsoever. Whereas traditionally a Scottish whiskey is allowing peat smoke mm -hmm. to be infused mm -hmm. into the, and also the region of different Scotland. Basically that varies from very, very light to phenomenally strong. Right. Almost as if you accidentally right. dumped out. Lafrig. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. yeah. basically Islay. Islay is renowned yeah. for it. Hard so, big, yeah. yeah. yeah right. And so, we're, weirdly, Islay is our closest point in, like, from ourselves ah, to right. Scotland. Right. We're only 17 miles from where we are on the north coast of Ireland to Scotland. The closest point between the north coast of Ireland and Scotland is only 11 miles. So even though we're so close, our styles of whiskey very, are, very are worlds vastly apart. Vastly different, yeah, yeah. vastly different. Uh, well, let's let's start with a little tasting. You uh, you pulled out a couple for us to taste first. Tell us about about these and what makes these uh, the place to start. Yeah, so basically what we have here are three of our blended whiskies, mm -hmm. and then we've got three of our single malt whiskies. Okay. So what we're going to start off, I always like doing things chronologically. Mm -hmm. So we've got a four, a five, an eight, a 10, a 16, and a 21. Okay. So the 10, 16, 21 are our single malt. So we'll start with our youngest blended whiskey. Okay. So the youngest one we have here is actually the newest addition to our family. Now remember, our family is over 411 years old. <laughs> so, I mean, this is a very recent addition. <laughs> so this is going to be a four-year-old whiskey. Mm -hmm. It is a blended whiskey. And the reason we blend whiskey is to make that whiskey accessible. So right. whenever I'm out at the bar, you know, you can have one, two, maybe even three of these. Whereas your single malt's... You can have one glass and take your time. Right. And is this where you would start someone if they said to you, I don't like whiskey? So can, well, can I can yeah. I can I back up just one moment? I wanna I wanna point out the difference between a single malt and a blended is because not all of our listeners know the real difference. So mm -hmm. blended whiskey is when you have a few different malt bills that you blend together yep. to create a flavor. So it's much like taking uh, some different ingredients to create a dish. Uh, whereas a single malt is telling you a couple things. That's saying single is telling you it's all under one roof and malt is the main mash bill going on there. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah. So uh, this is going to be, essentially this is actually designed for the American palate. This is not okay. even designed for the Irish palate. And the reason being is that this is matured only inside first fill, formerly used American bourbon barrels. So they've been used by the American bourbon industry once, and once only, obviously that's one of the rules within the bourbon industry. Mm -hmm. Now typically, most Irish whiskies will use that bourbon barrel once, twice, and three times to balance out the flavor. But for the Red Bush, we only use those first fill bourbon barrels. And that is why you'll see for a four-year-old whiskey, that's carrying quite a reddish mm -hmm. hue. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a comparison, the second one we're going to try, which is our original, you'll see it's actually lighter. Yeah. Right. Even though the it's original's more, older. Yeah, more of an amber. This uh, is actually an older whiskey. Yeah. Wow. So by using only first fill bourbon, you're going to get all those bourbon connotations, all those sweetnesses. It's a very, very sweet style. But remember, it's our whiskey. We've distilled it. We've matured it. We've bottled it. So instead of whenever it dries, instead of that bite, traditionally associated with a lot of bourbons, you're going to get the Irish smoothness. Right. And so, this is not whiskies that you've sourced from other distilleries. These are your yeah. own whiskies that you blended into this uh, into this first yes. uh, blend, the Red Bush. Yeah. So the, the uh, blend that we use, so obviously there's going to be a portion of our own triple distilled single malt. Mm -hmm. The grain whiskey that we use for the blending, that's tailor-made just to our specification, and that's made in a distillery on the south coast of Ireland. But okay. no one else has access to this green spirit. Okay. And we age everything on site ourselves. And, and this is blended with a specific goal in mind. You're looking for a specific flavor to uh, appeal to a specific palate. Is that right? Oh, yeah. And like we, we have a team. Uh, actually, our master blender for Bushmills is a lady called Helen Mulholland. <laughs> uh, she's been doing the job for the past 22 years. First female master blender ever in Irish history. Wow. 
Um, but, I mean, that's not the reason we hired her. We hired her because she was better than anyone else. <laughs> but it's well. down to her. She knows exactly what barrel she wants. She knows exactly what warehouse she wants the barrels from. She knows exactly what blend ratio. And Helen does this all from the knowledge that not only she gained through education, but this is a big difference about Bushmills. Is that we learn everything from our predecessors, the predecessors before them. It's been passed down from generation to generation to generation. Mm-hmm. This is what makes Bushmills so different to any other brand anywhere in the world, is that we are a family that has went from hand to hand for over 400 years, and that's 400 years with a license. Mm-hmm. And we know some of our earliest records uh, that there was mention of distillation almost a thousand years ago on the same wow. site we occupy today. What is what is the how big is the premises? Uh, we've got sixty three acres in total, and we're producing five million liters a year of pure alcohol. Um, now, with Irish whiskey exploding right now, um, whenever you visit the, dist- the distillery, you're going to see a massive amount of construction happening right now. So we are growing, um, and the best thing is that because we're so stubborn in the north coast of Ireland. We're not growing and making things more efficient. We're keeping true to exactly how we are. <laughs> so yes, we're sacrificing all efficiency for a new still house. Mm. But what we're going to keep is that same quality. Right. Because that's how we've stood the test of time. That's how we've stood the test of time when others have closed and others have changed. So let's taste this first one. This is, uh, this is basically crafted for the American palate, is what you were saying. Yep. And that makes sense that it would maybe be a little more uh, bourbon, uh, bourbon-esque, if oh, yeah. you will. Yeah, because you know where that's, that's where the American... Uh, well, you know there's so much popularity uh, for mm-hmm. bourbon uh, in the U.S. So um, we'll do just a little pour there. Pass that back to you. Yeah, um, you take the second honors. Thank you, sir. I'm actually going to pour a little bit for our engineer uh, over here. Oh, even better. Awesome. Oh, I. You know, on share, on the yeah, nose, I, you can definitely pick up the the bourbon uh, barrel okay. notes. Yeah. You can pick up the oak and the uh, the that sweetness you were talking about. That sweetness, and remember, by using we only use number two and number three char bourbon barrels. We mm-hmm. get them all from Calvin Cooperage in Kentucky. And what I actually have here, so uh, the person, oh, it actually oh, the second you see in the top this here. here. Yeah, yep. now be careful, uh, because uh-huh. this is actually a fresh sample. Oh, so you, I can see you got a little ah, bit of your hand, hand, there. hand. Yeah. So uh, Alex Thomas oh, is that. in charge of our maturation department. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, that's one of the best things about being from the distilleries. I can just literally give her a text <laughs> and WhatsApp, be like, hey, can I get a few more samples? <laughs> and uh, she sends them out. And this was only sent out a couple of weeks ago. So this is a very, very fresh sample. And you can see the crocodile in there, so you can tell it is a number two and number three char. Because as I travel around the country, uh, this char does wear down. And this is how you can see that used to be crocodile, okay. but it's yep. completely worn down now. So it, yep, yep. every now and again, you need to get the, fre- the samples freshened up. So mm. again, what you'll notice on the palate, you're going to get all that sweetness at the start. Mm-hmm. And then you'll notice it dries. But instead of that bite, that burn you're going to get that smoothness. Mm-hmm. That's so, a big round whiskey hug it really all is. the way down. It really is. It and happens, uh, it's interesting because it happens right at the point when you swallow, right at the back of the palate. You get that heat, but it's such a round, silky mm-hmm. kind of feeling. Round is and a you, great way to describe it. You're yeah. also describing Bushmills right there. That's silkiness, <laughs> that's softness. Yeah. That's that triple distillation. Mm-hmm. And that triple distillation is like copper pot stills. Right. So copper pot stills, weirdly, is actually even our trademark. We trademarked the Copper Pot still as a logo <laughs> back in 1784. So in the top of every single bottle, you will see nice. our trademark, which is that yeah, Copper Pot still. The Copper still. Pot still, yeah. So what, is a, what is a bottle of this? What's the price range on this bottle? This is going to be, I believe, under $25. That's in around that. Pretty yeah. fantastic at that price you point, gotta, especially. Yeah, yeah you got to love that. And that's, you know, again, this is your... Um, I was I was uh, kind of wondering about this earlier. Is this where you're likely to start someone who says, uh, when, I don't really like whiskey? Whenever I'm in, well, particularly in the southern United States, mm-hmm. whenever this is somehow what you call winter, mm-hmm. uh, where, where <laughs> I'm sweating still, it doesn't make sense. Just so you know, it's raining in 70 today yeah. here in uh, in our home city of Houston, and it's yeah, it's still hot. Yeah. yeah. So it's bizarre for me as an Irishman uh, to, to experience <laughs> this, but... Particularly whenever it's a warmer climate, this is the one I'm always going for. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, I'm based out of Jersey City, um, so I'm always in New York City. And there's a massive amount of Rick Houses, well, not well, Rick House themed whiskey bars Mm -hmm. where they're very, very pro bourbon. This is the one that will always fit in there. 
So yeah. if you want that little tagline, it's an Irish whiskey for the bourbon drinker. Okay. It's very, uh, like the the trailing um, aftertaste on this is very, uh, there's some cinnamon in there, there's some uh, vanilla in there. And a little bit of dried fruit on the tongue uh, is, is what I'm picking up. No, the fruit, I'm glad you mentioned the fruitiness, because that fruitiness is actually our distillate coming through. So if you ever come and visit Bushmills, which I hope you do eventually, um, whenever you're in the still house, we've got 10 stills in there, and they're all running at full capacity. The aroma in there is peaches, pear drops, it's red apple, a little bit of green. It's all these ripe, really distinctive fruity notes. Mm. So the fact if you're picking out the, those fruity notes, those yeah. lighter notes, that is our distillate. That really through. comes through on the retro hail too. Mm-hmm. It does. Like especially when you're... And mm. that note is only going to increase as we go through this range mm. <laughs> nice. as well. So, so when we go up then, and, and this is your, what would you call this? Your, your this, flagship, the, your standard? Yeah, this is our original. Bushmills okay, original, original is what we always call it. So Bushmills original uh, first appeared in 1888. It won the world's first gold medal in the Paris Expo of 1889. Wow. So this is going to be a five-year-old whiskey. Again, it's going to be a blended whiskey. And you said it was a four-year-old blended whiskey, the first one, For, First one, that's the red blend. bush that we yeah. just tried. So this, our malt content has increased, and I'll let you do the honors okay. again. Thank you. So this is going to be using bourbon barrels, but now in an even manner. So this is where we use them in a balanced way of once, twice, and three times. So unlike the red bush, which was only first fill, because mm-hmm. if you imagine the second time we use a bourbon barrel, everything started to mellow down. It's so interesting, the contrast between the two. The first mm-hmm. one, uh, just just on the nose, the first one, the red bush, is so much sweeter. Whereas this one has a little bit more of that, I just want to say, sort of a pure whiskey uh, aroma to yeah. it on the nose. It's like the vanilla is less, the mm-hmm. caramel is more. Mm-hmm. The maltiness comes out a little bit more. And even whenever you take a little sip, and this is where it becomes really interesting. Mm-hmm. So you'll notice it's a little bit bolder, a little more rounded. And you'll notice even around the lips, see that honeyed sweetness? It just lingers mm-hmm. there. Yes. Yeah, the honey is, is really... A lot more prominent. ...comes through in this. Interestingly it, enough, too, this one hits the middle of the palate in a very different way than the last very one. Different, very different, yeah. Different. And, e- even and creaminess can, as well. And I can totally see, though, why the the first one, why the Redbush is where you go for the American bourbon lover palate. Because this is just completely different. It's yeah. just almost night and day different from the Red Bush, wouldn't you say? Yeah, very much. Yeah. And yet we're only one year difference. We're still using the same barrels, but it's how we use them in different manners. I remember that's what happens after 411 years of practice. <laughs> I guess wow. at 411 years you get good at something, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so one of the best things I love for the, for the uh, Bushmills original, and there's actually a bar we work very closely with. Have you ever heard of the Dead Rabbit in New York City? Heard of, yes. Yes, so it's one of the world's best bar, two years in a row running. Um, now, one of their signature drinks is the Irish coffee. Mm. And one of their lead bartenders is a lady called Gillian Vos. I mean, the, t- one, the two founders were two guys from Belfast, a uh, bartender and a bar manager from Belfast. So obviously that's rooted back home because Belfast is the same county as Bushmills up in the north coast of Ireland. But their lead bartender, they perfected the ratio of what an Irish coffee should be. As I've traveled this country for nearly two years, Irish coffee is made wrong in so many different ways. <laughs> and one of the worst things, like an Irish coffee, if you're intimidated by an Irish coffee or an Irish coffee takes too many ingredients or it takes too long to prepare, it's made wrong. Yeah. The perfect way to do it is literally a six ounce glass. It's one ounce original. It's half an ounce Demer Irish uh, sugar syrup, so the brown sugar syrup, because you get a little more of a maple tone. Mm-hmm. Then you're doing about just under four and a half ounces of good drip coffee and you just layer it with heavy cream. Not your whipped cream from a can, because that is not an Irish style. You go to Ireland, you'll struggle to find that. So remember, if you're putting whipped cream on it, that's not an Irish coffee. So it's just heavy cream. You just shake it up, thicken it up, and you Mm -hmm. just layer it on so it looks like a baby Guinness. And, well, I think today's weather is perfect. (laughs) I know. You should have brought some ingredients. Well, well, the best thing is, yesterday I was doing uh, Irish coffee training. And, uh, yeah, my palate was salivating then as well. <laughs> well, but unfortunately, it was what? It was hitting nearly 85 degrees, was it, yesterday? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so obviously today is ideal for it. Yesterday was a little bit intense for me. We don't sell a lot of cars without AC here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, trust <laughs> me. I've, 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 learned, I've learned the benefit of, like, the local team whenever they, they threw me in the car. And I'm just like, 
I'm going to shift up to beer here and taste our first beer, which is, and Ian, after I pop this open, I'll have you kind of show this to the camera. Ah, uh, nice. the sound effects. That was nice. Uh, this is the St. Arnold Gutentag, which is, uh, uh, they describe it as toasty and clean. It is their Bavarian-style lager. We are big fans of the St. Arnold uh, Brewery uh, here, Jack. They are uh, based here in Houston, and they just have been a, well, it's the oldest craft brewery in Texas, mm-hmm. and they have just been a producer of, uh, of really great uh, beers of all styles for a long time. They're... They only have one beer, I think, that I don't like, uh, and that's just because it's not to my particular uh, palate. But uh, they they have done a great job for so long, have not sold out to the big companies. They uh, they continue to just do their thing, and we've actually never had them on the show, which is a crime. We've got to get well, to yeah, well, I don't know why we haven't. Yeah, we've I had many know. of their beers. Yeah. Uh, I'm, we, we I'm have, such so. a huge fan of their seasonals. Oh, uh, my God. And they're, uh, I still, I'm covering a little bit of Oktoberfest that I have left in my refrigerator, and so now good. Christmas Ale came out. Christmas Ale is out, and it's fantastic. And, and if then, you are a fan of Beer Jack. Oh, yeah. Find a St. Arnold Christmas ale. It's so good. Mm, mm. So good. See, this is just reminding me of uh, Belfast actually does a very big event for Oktoberfest. Mm-hmm. I mean, the beer halls are just crazy. <laughs> and this smell mm-hmm. is reminding me whenever you eventually get up to the front of the queue, you know, it's a 20 minute queue to get up to the to, yeah, to death. get up. Yeah. And as soon as I smell that, that tap going, this, uh, yeah. this, this smell this just is brought really me right back. good. Yeah, Ian, I had a feeling you were going to like this as soon as I tasted it because. The malt profile is, is just malty. really, I love the malt. really in the front, and that's your uh, that's your thing. It's got a bigger mouth feel than I would expect, too. Mm-hmm. It's, For a Bavarian it's, lager, I agree. Yes. Yeah. For a lager in general, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. It's, it's very mm. nice. The um, the uh, 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 CO two in here is just right too. The carbonation yes. is is like just just enough to tickle your uh, palate, but not enough to get in the way. I do not see. Wait, hold on. Yes, five point eight percent. I want a candle that smells like yeah. this. Oh yeah, so wouldn't that be great? <laughs> so good. Yeah, you might uh, show that to the camera there. It's a, it's a very attractive uh, uh, can, and the, you know, again, these guys, these guys just do great work. We're proud and, to be from the same city they're from. And for those of you, I'm talking to you, Freon. For those of you who are just listening to this, the can looks cool. Yeah, thank you for. <laughs> <laughs> he pointed out last night. He goes, I never. I always listen to it. I never watch it. So. Well, it's, uh, you know, that's good. We'll try to know, describe a lot of people, it. A lot of people will uh, download it and, uh, you know, listen to it in the car <laughs> or, or, you know, stream it in the car or whatever. So, yeah, so a lot of people uh, hear the show rather than uh, rather than talking about it. But if, you, if you're just hearing the show, then you miss out on our technological advances like Mr. Twirly Gig. Well, and, don't forget, uh, if, you, if, you put on the, uh, if you put on the TV when you get home, you can mm-hmm. always have us playing in the background on... Uh, on uh, YouTube, great YouTube for those. Channel, yeah, there? great for those romantic nights. Absolutely when you're romantic on the couch, evenings. You know? Us in the background. That's yeah. A couple it candles lit. The smell like yeah. It doesn't get uh, much, but I mean, it smell like guten tag. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, well, well, how I, can I, it get better than that? I love this. I think this is is just absolutely terrific, and I you know I'll chalk up another big success to these guys, and I think it's. Worth noting that this is a very different malt forward flavor than their Oktoberfest. Yes, you know, yes. which is also very malt forward, but in a very different way. So this, I really do want to wear this like cologne. Although I think mm-hmm. it, I feel like that would be hard to explain to a police officer. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I just love the way it smells. <laughs> It's awkward. Have you been drinking, sir? No. <laughs> well, no. you certainly smell like you I just, have. I just yeah. wear this. I just, I just dump it on myself. It works for me. Um, all right. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take a uh, quick break. We'll be uh, back to taste more Bushmills. We'll also be ta- tasting an IPA that's a collaboration from Ecliptic uh, Brewing and Bells, two, two breweries that we love. Separately from each other, so try that. we'll we'll see uh, we'll see how they do together. Uh, plus, when we return, is Heineken better than craft beer? We'll get into that uh, and why that's even a question. Coming up. <laughs> this is the first time I just have to do that sound effect every time you say it. <laughs> oh, welcome back! It's smoking and toasting. Uh, this is the. Little program that's all about craft beer, frying spirits, and hand rolled cigars. We are on show number one hundred and sixty-two. We are tasting Bushmills, and then asking the question: Is Heineken better than craft beer? Now, let me tell you why I ask this. 
every every week when we get ready to do the show, unless I've been particularly lazy, um, I usually try to go uh, and spend a few minutes on the internet, seeing if there's any new interesting stories that revolve around you know craft beer or cigars or whiskey, something going on out there in the world that might be you know, something we'd we'd want to mention on the program. So I generally type into my Google browser craft beer news. And what I discovered when I did that this week is when I type craft beer news, or I also discovered you can get the same result by just typing craft beer and entering in Google, the first thing that shows up on the page is an ad, as Google sometimes you know, will sell an ad that'll be the top of the page, mm-hmm. and then, then you get to the search results, right? Well, the ad was for Heineken and a link to the Heineken um, webpage. But what it said is Heineken. No, I'm sorry. It didn't say Heineken first. It said better than craft beer. Heineken.com. This is the ad campaign that Heineken appears to be using. Now, I don't know if they're aver- advertising it anywhere else. But on the web, like right there in the ad, it says better than craft beer. Your thoughts, Ian? <laughs> I, I can't stop hitting this. It's hilarious. Uh, yeah, the more uh, I hit it, the funnier it actually if, gets. If you click um, on, it's better than craft beer slash Heineken. If you click on it, it directs you right to the Heineken webpage, which, by the way, spends most of its time um, promoting their zero uh Carb or whatever it is, their Heineken yeah, Zero, yeah. which is their they're non-alcoholic. I, think. I, have, a, I have a Heineken story. Okay, um, I was bashing a bit on Heineken at one point in time because Heineken's got the green bottle itis. Right, it's always skunky, and it always tastes skunky. And I can't believe that people drink it because it tastes skunky. It even stinks skunky. Mm-hmm. Like when you open up a green bottle Heineken, it's like, ugh. It's not a good smell. Now, I will quote you, though, from the light beer blind taste test that we did when you tasted the Bud Light Lime. Uh, and, you, and I said, oh, I, I j- can't deal with this flavor. And you said, at least there's flavor. I would say that. But it wasn't about, skunky. About Heineken. No, it was. I mean, lemon, it wasn't it, good. But it, it was lemon skunky. pledge, <laughs> but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't skunky. I like, so. My favorite part of that, by the way, yeah. is that we all said it tasted like lemon pledge. <laughs> no one caught that it was actually lime. Oh, yeah. yeah it was supposed <laughs> like, to be Bud Light like Lime. Yeah. So, uh, no. Uh, so, Heineken. anyway, I was, I, was, I was Heineken bashing at one point in time, and a friend of mine said, No, Heineken's not that bad a beer. And I said, It's always skunky. And he goes, Well, yes, but that's the green bottle thing. If you actually get it out of a keg, mm-hmm. Or in a can, it's not skunky. So, oddly enough, within the next couple of days, I happened to be in a store that had one of those little mini kegs, and mm-hmm. I was going to a party. So I thought, I'll, I'll buy one it. of those. Why not try it? Right? Um, it's not bad. Okay. Better than craft beer? <sighs> no, I don't think so. Uh, it's it's just beer. It's not a particularly amazing beer, and it's usually skunky. So I just avoid it at all costs. Um, I think they're. I think they're reaching a little bit with mm-hmm. their better than craft beer. There are a lot of people that drink Heineken for a few reasons. One is it's a little more exotic, but everybody knows what it is. Right. So it's safe exotic, safe mm-hmm. German beer. Um, it's available in most places. And, of course, that hails back to before craft beer was amazing. And even the European side of uh, beer had to start keeping up with the United States. Everyone used to think, well, the only good beer you get is in Europe. Right, right. You know, so I Germany, think Austria. I think they're, still, you know, I think that, they're yeah. trying to maybe tap into a little bit of that mentality, but that mentality is not true. You right. know, I mean, when you're talking about breweries like Guinness, who are starting to make American style beers mm-hmm. to keep up, which, by the way, kudos to them, and all their beers are great. I've tried almost, you know, I'll try anything from the the Guinness uh, 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 brewery, and they do great stuff. But even Guinness is keeping up with the times now. That being said, Heineken hasn't put anything out except for their Ultra Light, other than their Heineken, right? Right. right. Yeah, Heineken, and, and Heineken and Light, zero, which is not good. Yeah, the zero. Yeah, it's uh, which and, is the uh, non-alcoholic, I think. Right. Well, you got yeah. So they haven't put out anything new in a long time. So they're trying to. It sounds to me like they're trying to revamp something old and make you think of it as kind of new, or maybe so classic that it's better than what's new. Mm-hmm. And I I don't think that they're going to hit it with that because. I think that a lot of people, if you try a Heineken and you try that same style next to almost any local brewery, it's getting its butt whipped. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm it just right. is. 
So you know? is it in fact then? And I got to wonder too, is because everyone's been drinking skunky tasting Heineken, has skunk just become part of the flavor of Heineken? Well, is that like something they have to engineer in because that's what people expect? Because uh, it's it's kind of skunky, you know? So, so would you say then that this is the most bogus macro beer claim since Dilly Dilly? I would say, and I quote... I think that takes us where we need to go. Let's let's go back to talking Bushmills. Then this will, this will work a lot better. <laughs> yeah, I just think I, Heineken, you're you're overreaching there, buddy. Yeah, you I know, th- I think you got so. beer, sell it. I think somebody so. will drink it. And and you know, it kind of reminds me in my early days of uh, being in radio broadcasting. I remember they would teach you that one of the things that you should do is that you should tell the audience what you want them to believe. So, for example. If you're if you were at a, working at a station, and you wanted it to, uh, you wanted your audience to think that you played the most music. You would tell them the most music, and then um, whatever your. But station but isn't was, it right? true that pretty much every station owned by that giant company plays the exact same amount of music well, every hour? Yes, but but the point. Okay, is, I just want yeah, I just want to make yeah. sure. But the, but the point is that it isn't about. It never was about whether you actually played the most music or not. Or the best music, and is it like something uh, like twenty minutes of music per hour? Pretty, yeah. That's and then, if, if uh, you're and lucky, then forty minutes of advertisement. Lucky. Yeah, yeah. If yeah, you're yeah. lucky, uh, but the point is that you would say what you wanted people, right, right, to think, and somehow they would magically believe you, which strikes me as what Heineken's trying to do. Well, yeah. Well, trying it's a sales pitch. If you beer. nod and put something in someone's hand, yes, this is good, right? No, nah, nah, the first <laughs> thing they want to do is nod and go, yeah, and grab for it, right? Yeah, it's a sales pitch. <laughs> All right. Well, works for me, or actually, it doesn't work for me. But, <laughs> but you know, that's uh, that's okay. It's kind of a ridiculous. Is it better than craft beer? No. How is it better than craft beer? I like. What are they even basing that on? Might be some craft beer that it would be better. Than. Like if you got a really shitty craft beer, I, uh, Heineken might be better. There's yeah, been a few. There's been a few. Heineken might be better. Yeah. Well, better than. <laughs> Better than the worst that craft beer has to offer. Yeah, I mean, See, there, there has to be a disclaimer ring, in there somewhere. That didn't somewhere, sound right? as good in the ad <laughs> meetings. So, uh, uh, all right. So let's let's talk something that is good. Let's talk push mills. Um, we have tried two of your blended whiskeys. You brought three blendeds and three that are single malt, correct? Yep. Uh, so, what is the blended that you saved uh, for last then? So this is going to be our black bush. Now, Black so Bush we did Red Bush, we did Original, and now Black Bush. Black Bush. Okay. Now, Black Bush has remained unchanged since 1898. This, in the words of our master blender, again, Helen Mulholland, she calls, calls us her lovable rogue. So Black Bush <laughs> is, is uh, significantly different. It's what we call the three eights. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be eight years old. It's going to be 80% single malt. And it's going to be 80% all are also Spanish sherry cask. Okay. So we're now going to use a completely different style of wood. Mm-hmm. Also, you should notice 80% single malt for a blended whiskey. For That's any a blended pretty high whiskey. percentage of single malt, yeah, right? It's, yeah. it's next to being unheard of. It's huh. phenomenal. That's almost high. not blended at that point. Right. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're only 20% away from right. not being blended. Yeah. yeah. And um, the big thing is that sherry cask is very, very ro- robust. Now, I noticed that in the first two blendeds came with the screw-off cap, but here we have transitioned to a cork. Is there, other than just, obviously, we're getting into a you know, a slightly more expensive uh, bottle, and maybe that seems classier, is there another reason for this being a cork? It's, well, once we get into it, you'll, this will make a little bit more sense. The black bush is a lot richer, and the black bush, the finish on there, mm-hmm. is it lasts for 30 seconds minimum. I mean, you're still getting a hint of it past 45 seconds, even a little linger just by a minute. Whereas with these, no, no one should drink at a faster pace or drink more than they should. Mm-hmm. Just to clear, Disclaimer. Clear, clear, yeah, clear the water. But <laughs> you're, these are going to be consumed at a faster pace than the Black Bush because there is so much in there. You'll take a glass and you'll even lean back and just sip, savor and watch. So if something does take a longer time to go through, well, you're going to have that cork. And then the best thing is that whenever you do, this makes it so much more special. And yeah. it's a great sound, too. Yeah. <laughs> it really that's, is. Thank that's you how you know yeah. something special is coming along. So it, what I love about what you're saying is it gets into one of the things we talk about quite a bit here on the show, which is that, you know, it, it's one thing to drink alcohol or a great cocktail or, uh, you know, just a good sort of, uh, you know, lager beer or something. But what we really love, what we love sharing with people is when it's more about the sipping and it's more about just 
kind of leaning back, savoring something. It's about the experience. It's a part of what appeals to all of us about the world of cigars. It's just that that ability to just kind of relax. As as Ian so brilliantly has said on the show, you can't hurry up and smoke a cigar. Mm -hmm. And I think kind of the higher the quality that you go with the whiskey, the more that begins to apply to you. Don't want to hurry up. You want to you want to just chill and let it let it offer you that experience. Yeah. And so and this one, well, you'll see. So I've again, talked myself into this experience. Where did, did Black Book Black Bush get its name? So remember when I said this came about in eighteen ninety eight? Yes. So in eighteen ninety eight, in Ireland, particularly in particularly the north coast of Ireland, uh, gas lighting was everywhere in bars. Now whenever this is a gas lit bar and you've got something matured inside an all that also sherry cask. Well, this comes up nearly black in color compared to everything else. Ah, so that under, under color, the gaslight. Yeah, under the gaslighting. Okay. Whenever it's on the shelf of the bar, that's coming out nearly black in color. And mm. Remember, by 1898, not a lot of distilleries were using sherry casks. Right. Remember, by right. 1898, Irish whiskey was the king of the world. Scottish whiskey was the second one. Scottish whiskey is the one that you only went for if you, you know, had to. <laughs> I, it was American prohibition that changed everything. On top of that, there was the coffee still invention. Mm -hmm. um, which weirdly was an Irish invention, but then the Scots realized it was more efficient. They're a very tight set and of And they people. adopted it, yeah. Oh, yeah, because you know, they like to cut things, they like to save things, they like to cut corners where they can. And the coffee's still perfect for doing that. But um, it was a combination of those two, two things that demised Irish whiskey. Mm -hmm. But remember, by this stage, 1898, Irish whiskey was the number one chosen whiskey throughout the world. Now, the Black Bush, the good things that you, you've already been sipping it. And this is the thing I love. Whenever, whenever you get a whiskey a little more complex, a little bit richer, I want someone to have the first sip on their own terms because you'll just see that radical change. And I already mm -hmm. see it in the body language <laughs> from the two of you. <laughs> yeah. Is that, so the nose is bigger. It's fuller. Mm -hmm. A sherry cask is inherently very dry, very nutty. Remember I kept saying our distillate is very light, very floral, mm -hmm. very fruity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Peaches, pear drops, and a little bit of red apple. Now you marry those two together. You're going to get this Christmas cake. You're going to get this fruit cake. You're going to notice whenever you take a little sip, this just glides across the palate. Yeah, this is, is so nice the way it does. Uh, the, the funny uh, difference with this one is the fruit hits first. Yes. Like mm -hmm. it really Very hits fruit the forward. beginning. I agree. And Reason. then and then you're so right about that lingering uh, aftertaste and, and a little bit of that heat, what I like to call the whiskey hug, comes back and it's just there for a long time you know maybe it's something that happens to me as i get older but the older i get the more i am about savoring the moments of life and the more that i enjoy whether it's a, a great meal at a restaurant or whether it's you know a, a great whiskey or a great cigar it's it's about being able to just really kind of soak it in and go you know this moment may not come again Let's experience this for all it's worth. Whereas, you know, when I was in college, it was about how many shots can we do, and right. and and uh, uh, you know, let's let's just grab the cheapest hamburgers or tacos that we can <laughs> grab or whatever. You know, uh, the whole quality versus quantity thing has to do with savoring the experience, mm -hmm. and and so this is where we move into a whiskey that I feel like really kind of creates that vibe when you sip it. It's, it really is a sipping whiskey, not a drinking whiskey, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you, like, do you understand what I was saying earlier? Yes. That finish. Like, you get the build up of flavor after about 10, 15 seconds in the mm -hmm. jawline, and that wee gentle glow mm -hmm. just comes at the back of the throat, and it just rumbles on through. Just this, now, weirdly, the best way I enjoy drinking a Blackbush, I mean, this is very much Irish weather, if we minus the heat and humidity. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in Belfast... In most of the bars, what we did was what we called a serve of a black and black, a black pint and a black bush. Now, if you're in Belfast, you can imagine, what is that black pint? It's a stout. Right. You know, I'm not going to say the brand name. You use it more than welcome to. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you get a pint of that. You get a black bush in the side. Well, if you rush that famous style of black Irish stout, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well, you're probably going to see it back again. So you're going you're to take your time. Spoiler he's talking about Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, but with Blackbush, because it is so rich, you're not going to rush that. And it's an, it's right. an internal reaction. Mm -hmm. You're not going to rush something that's that rich. No, you're right. We, and the you, two side by side, black and black, 
instinctively, really, really well instinctively we slowed down. And it's not like we were gulping the first two, but like instinctively you just take it a little slower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the, totally the flavors works. on this are so complex, and they last so long on the palate. Like, I'm still tasting from before you started oh, for that. sure, yeah. That whole explanation, and it's still there. And I, I kind of like that about it. And it also just has a little more of that, uh, a little more oiliness that really spreads mm -hmm. it across the palate and gives it a little. Uh, I usually call it kind of a buttery. You, you've been referring to it as a creaminess, but yeah. it really, really does spread out and just linger on the palate in such a nice way. So that buttery note, because we've increased the malt, that butteriness. So our distillate. No, you're not meant to drink it when you're in the still house, but you know, there's times that you, okay, <laughs> you, you things you get, <laughs> things happen. Yeah, yeah. So like you, you dip your finger in, and whenever you taste it, obviously the fruit's straight away, straight there. But we distill up to about. 83%, so it's 166 proof. So it evaporates within a second or two, but you're left with this butteriness. And that butteriness that you mentioned is going to keep increasing as we go yeah. go up through the malt nice. content mm, nice. as well. Nice. So um, do I, now I will admit, as we move on to the next one, that I am a little bit worried about pairing, uh, not that we're trying to pair it, but I am a little bit worried about going to an IPA after this because this yeah. is such a... Uh, such a different uh, world we're we're living in right now, you know. But with their tenure, we're going back to a very light style. Okay. So we could actually be saved. All right. So all right. So we'll see. so let's go there next. Let's go yeah. with the tenure. So, so the tenure. This is the first uh, of these that we're trying. That's a single malt. Yeah, hundred percent single malt. This is going to be what we call a two wood whiskey. Okay. What that simply means is that we've got whiskey maturing for ten years inside a bourbon barrel, whiskey maturing for ten years inside a sherry cask. It's a side by side maturation. Simultaneous maturation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Only at the end of the minimum of 10 years maturing do we marry those two whiskeys together. But because they came from the same malt, same malt, it continues to uh, a single malt. be a single malt. Yeah. Now, I explain to <coughs> someone who might not know, uh, there is sort of a general perception that a single malt whiskey would be superior to a, a blended whiskey. Is, is that really true? And if so, why would that be? Well, not, what about it would be better? Not always. Uh, you can get some great blended whiskeys mm -hmm. out in the market. Mm -hmm. Just because it's single malt, just because it's more expensive, has nothing to do with a better quality. Mm -hmm. I mean, people ask me, what's my favorite whiskey out of the range? The amount of times I'm going for either sometimes Red Bush or Original because I'm in a busier environment. If I'm in a busier environment, I'm not going to get the benefit of these more complex, more delicate malts. It's something that's designed to be really safe. Those are more slow down or yeah. special occasion mm -hmm. almost where mm -hmm. you can sit down and really enjoy Agreed. it. And then, the, mm -hmm. and then there's some distilleries that just get it wrong. You know, they just didn't come out the way it should have. Particularly whenever you get distilleries that are doing batches because you've probably noticed we do consistent bottling. We mm -hmm. don't do a year. We don't do a batch. We right. always guarantee this will taste the same today, tomorrow, five years, 20 years, 30 years, even on your deathbed. Right. This will always it's not taste like a wine with a vintage uh, exactly. that that could be where the uh, you know the uh, uh, ninety five could be different from the ninety six you know uh, yeah right so but the big the challenge for us <laughs> and I'll let you do the honors okay and um, the challenge for us is the fact whiskey keeps changing climate keeps changing mm -hmm. and to balance this flavor out this is really actually Helen's hardest job and this is Helen's favorite whiskey because it is the most delicate we produce it's the hardest to get right every single time and yet she manages it. Well, so whiskey, uh, whiskey uh, blenders uh, in general, it's it's a fascinating art form that there's so many variables. It just it actually kind of breaks my brain a little bit trying to wrap my head about. Yeah, it. I, I know, have no like, clue how they because pull it off. what you're talking about here is you're talking about this is going to taste the same no matter what. You're talking about uh, an organic um, an organic thing that. Your ingredients change. Like, uh, your grain can never be exactly the same. Like, mm -hmm. even if it's grown in the same place from year to year, there's going to be little differences. Um, and you have to come up with the same flavor mm -hmm. and consistency every single time, no matter how much, like, the weather had an effect on how your grain grows and how your malt uh, Well, plus, if you think about like just, that. just think about the soil. I mean, crops have to be rotated mm -hmm. because of the very reason that this year's wheat crop is not going to pull the same stuff out of the same soil as last year's wheat crop. So you, you have to rotate, and then that's going to cause changes. I mean, everything induces change to this whole uh, dynamic. And that's what's and amazing about a master distiller is they're able to somehow compensate for that. With that yeah, with that mm -hmm. list of variables, 
they can still put out that bottle that tastes the same every single time. Mm. We're so close that mere mortals that don't have that kind of palate will never be able to tell right, the difference. Right. And yeah, I wonder sometimes, you know, when you see someone go into a bar and they order, you know, the most expensive single malt that the bar carries, you wonder sometimes, sh- sure, obviously they've got the money to spend on it, but are they able to comprehend what they're paying for so you you wonder sometimes oh, you know yeah. no, Cause I, i'm not sure i do in the in the most extreme of cases but the more i've tried the more i've learned the more i've been able to tell the difference and and appreciate i it. think whenever you get into whiskeys that are going into that 20 year period mm-hmm. close to it you need to be in the right environment and for me that's a hotel lobby and a, and a fine hotel lobby you know for mm-hmm. but well, to get five star where they've got the little areas that you can't be discovered for half an hour. Mm-hmm. You've got mm-hmm. the style of chair you can sink back into. You've mm-hmm. got the area that no one's going to find you, no one's going to bother you. Well, then that's the best place to enjoy a complex single malt. Because mm-hmm. you're already in that you know, very luxurious environment. Yep. And you're in that moment. And that moment will also, yes, it'll feed into how great the whiskey is. But you need time. You need space. You need to be away from different aromas. You need to be away from people. You need to discover at your own time and place as well. Now, have you seen with the 10-year that it is a lot lighter? It is predominantly mm-hmm. bourbon. It bar, is lighter, yeah. But the maltiness really comes out now. You're going to get that fruitiness is probably the most prominent now. And it's the ripe fruit. Whenever you take that sip, that honeyness not only coats the lips, but it coats the entire front of the tongue. And it's the first one of these where I've detected, and not as much as you might get in your typical... Um, Scottish uh, whiskey, but it's the first one where I've detected a little bit of that minerality mm. that uh, that you often get from a single malt. You know, a mm-hmm. uh, little bit of that, like you said, a little, a little bit more of, of the water, so to speak. Uh, yes, yeah. yes, that's a good way of putting it. Yes, it's uh, this is I think though very accessible. I mean, it, it's it's in its own way, it's just as accessible as the Red Bush is. Yeah, uh, but it's just a different thing to access. Yeah, you know? I mean, like for it being so light. This is actually my summertime whiskey. So weirdly, mm-hmm. in the space of 24 hours, the weather changing here. This is the whiskey I was reaching for yesterday. Even at uh, dinner last night, uh, we got an insane amount of oysters. And <laughs> one of the best things that we've done in the past is actually we get a bottle of 10-year. We freeze it. You know, obviously it's 80 proof alcohol, so it mm-hmm. doesn't go solid. Sure. But it comes out comes out lot. syrupy. Yeah, yeah, yeah syrupy. real, real viscous. So you've closed off the alcohol notes. And you see that honeyed note there? See, whenever you cool it down, and mm-hmm. when you freeze it, it comes out so much more prominent. So whenever you always get northeast coast oysters, because the ones down here in, in the Gulf, I don't, I don't they eat, are. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't eat Gulf oysters. I, mean, I, I look at them and it's like, how, how is this going to happen? I, I don't eat it's, Gulf it's oysters. It's not going to go down. I enjoy life. I don't <laughs> eat <laughs> Gulf oysters. But, but the North uh, Point, but yeah. yeah, yeah no, northeast coast. Yes. And just as it's getting served, so sometimes we've had it where we get one server coming out with the oyster, mm-hmm. second server with a frozen bottle of 10, as it's being served, just one by one, just pour a little bit of tenure over, and down it goes. And oh, I wow! Bet that's good. Oh, wow! I bet that's it's good. it's uh, it's something else. I mean, even even when, when I had friends over and we'd still the heat back in Jersey City, I've got a great rooftop uh, overlooking New York City, and I put this in a wine cooler. So I keep it in the fridge for maybe about six, seven hours. Put it in a wine cooler. Go up to the roof. Get a few of the boys around, and we just sit back. We get some of the cigars, and we just relax and enjoy that. Nice. It's a cool whiskey. I. Now, whiskey's personal. There's no right or wrong way to enjoy it. Right. Whiskey's always personal. The way someone enjoys it is the right way for them. But I do find the 10 years too delicate for ice. Ice could overpower those really delicate mm. notes. Uh, well, the cold cold in general will mask a lot of flavors, too. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But how does it do with a little water? A little water? Okay, yeah, if you've got some water, a uh, drop or uh, two. Yeah. Do you have a uh, Do you have your bottle of water over there, Ian? I don't. I don't have, have a bottle me. of water. All right, we'll have to try this maybe in the next segment then, yeah. uh, so we can uh, so we can see how it, how it might change that up. Because uh, uh, you're right, I, I'm guessing it would change it up a little bit. Although, you know, this is not a real uh, sort of a heavier flavor, heavy mouth feel. So. I would I would guess that the water would mellow it out just a little more, maybe make it a little buttery. You, you'd you'd be surprised. Really? This this is one of the best things about Bushmills single malts is that what you expect isn't is not, not necessarily where it happen. goes. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. I want to put this with like a, uh, an Aladino, Connecticut, or even Ooh. a La Polina uh, Candela. 
You What's know? that candela they had? I bet yes. that would go amazing with this. No, I think you're right. And that the uh, Aladino Connecticut, how great would that be as a mm-hmm. pairing? Oh, that would just, just be terrific. Well, speaking of pairing. Lovely, sir. Our, thank you. Uh, uh, two of our favorite breweries, Ecliptic Brewing uh, out of Portland, Oregon, and Bell's out of uh, Michigan. Uh, have been collaborating for five years. Five years, five beers is what this is called. It's a juicy IPA. This may be completely different than anything we've tasted on the show, but I'm pouring a little bit of it. And the first thing I'm going to notice about it is it looks much less hazy than I was expecting. I was yeah, expecting, you would expect for a hazy IPA for it to be a little more hazy. Yeah, well, it's in, hazy. In uh, in fairness, it doesn't describe itself as hazy. It but describes we're, itself think, as juicy. So oh well, there's that. But I think we're used to also seeing a lot of the. Newer juicy slash hazy IPAs mm-hmm. looking like orange juice, right? Right, and and <laughs> you know, and like, certainly a lot of them do. This one though comes in a little bit, uh, a little bit more like a traditional looking uh, IPA. Uh, so, wow, orange on the nose, big time. Well, let's see let's see what it says on the bottle about this. It just says five years, five beers. It says in celebration of our fifth year of passage through this awesome star system we call home, we're teaming up with five esteemed breweries. Uh, to brew five beers of cosmic significance. So I was wrong about this. It's not that they've done a collaboration for five consecutive years. It's in celebrating at Ecliptic their fifth year, they decided to team up with five different breweries. This is the Ah, one they did with Bells. So um, it says uh, space can be a bit lonely too, so here's to making the journey with friends. Brewed with Bells owner Larry Bell and brewers John Mallett and Tim Gossick. Uh, Ecliptic Brewing... Portland, Oregon, Earth. This is like a juice cocktail. I taste grapefruit yeah. on the uh, on the back end of this, big time. A lot Ooh. of orange right up front. There's a malt factor that happens right in the middle of this that's really wow. interesting. This is almost as if uh, Stone decided to make something juicy and it got weird. Mm, and it got weird. Yeah, <laughs> and it's, it's pretty good. I like it. Actually. I, I love this. I think it's fantastic. Um, it is. On the finish, it, so so when you take it first, like the the first flavors that hit your tongue are sort of that mixed citrus. You get a little bit of the orange and and the. But what I'm getting, and it could be because of the uh, the bushmills, but what I'm getting on the finish is that really almost sour grapefruit, like the yeah. the really. Um, Almost bitter grapefruit, but in, bitter in a good way, not yeah. a, not a bad way. Um, it's wow, this is really interesting. One of the most complex IPAs There's, I've had in a while. It, it's not a pine cone kind of bitterness mm-mm, to it mm-mm. at all. It's more of a. Uh, uh, it's like a call? juicy like a slice of grapefruit, grapefruit zest mm-hmm. almost kind of right. bitterness. Yeah, right, right, very, very much that. Not How are you the, feeling about this one? Yeah, no, it's it's again, it's orange in the nose. Grapefruit just carries through. Always through the back, but I find a little bit of lemon rind on the side. Right. Yes, I can go with that. It's, mm-hmm. it's those three citrus fruits are just mm-hmm. so so prominent. Now I do believe that multi note has probably been amplified by the ten year, because if we didn't have maybe, the multi note yeah. in the ten, that could our, be. our yes. palate maybe not have been so not as attuned to it. Exactly mm-hmm. right. This is eight point five percent, so it's a little higher than your standard IPA, which is usually six and a half to seven. Uh, but it's uh, wow, it, I think it's really good. Uh, again. Uh, just so you uh, just know, Jack, I mean, Ian tends to be the guy on the show that leans a little more towards the stouts and the maltier things, which I also like, but uh, I'm I'm the guy that's crazy for IPAs, so it's a, um, it's always interesting to me when I bring an IPA on the show that Ian likes. Yeah, uh, this is, this yeah. definitely goes on the list of IPAs I like. Yeah. So I would, yeah, yeah, I would cool. give it that. And it's funny because it's got that, that bitterness... But it's not a resiny bitterness. It's a fruity bitterness. No, it's not a hop bitterness. It's a, it's more like a grapefruit bitterness. But it is very hoppy on top y- yes, of all that. Yes, it is. So. Yes, it is, uh, without question. Well, we've made it through all but two of the uh, Bushmills, so we'll be back uh, with uh, one more segment here in just a moment. And in that segment, we will not only taste two more single malts, the 16 and the 21. And I'll, you know, no spoiler here, but... Um, Jack's already hinted that I may the sixteen may be my favorite. Mm. The so yep. So see, go, go, yep. Going by the ethos of the show. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. So so we'll see how that works out. Uh, plus one more beer. It's the uh, it's the White Devil, the Imperial White Ale, and I'm really curious as to how this one's going to match up. So we'll be looking forward to that in our final segment coming up next. You are checking out smoking and toasting. 
So going back to that tenure, yeah, it turns into. Welcome back. It's smoking and toasting. It is uh, program number one hundred and sixty-two, uh, and we are proud to be brought to you by B and B Butchers and Restaurant, eighteen fourteen Washington Ave in Houston, and in the shops at Clear Fork in Fort Worth. Ian, I saw you. Are you checking out the show notes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Brian, uh, Wiki Brian, one of our favorite uh, uh, regulars that does comments on here mentioned mm-hmm. he goes jack could get my wife to drink bush mills she's a sucker for the accent <laughs> <laughs> i think it uh, yeah i think i think it works um beers with distinct possibilities or i'm sorry beers with distinct personalities is how this one is described and uh, ian tell me again how you pronounce that because that's uh I would just, it's K U H N H E N N, so Kunin is what I would say. We tried to contact them actually earlier today and we're unsuccessful. So yeah, we, we I, was, I usually send out an email to the distilleries just mm-hmm. saying, or to the breweries just saying, hey, we're going to try your product, so check mm-hmm. it out. And if you like what we say about it, share it, post right. it. Um, there is no way on their website to email them. Yeah, like I could not kind of, find yeah. it at all. <laughs> they kept running me around in a circle. You can, you can have them text you with information and all kinds of other stuff. Um, but you can't, there's not a contact us. A I note. scrolled to the bottom of the page. Sometimes you find it. there was no way to find it there. <laughs> this looks really, this is, a, it's an, not an interesting can. It's kind of a friendly color, I guess. Yeah. Of, of red. Um, 1998 white devil made with Michigan raw wheat and Pilsner malt. This ale is golden color and has a distinct fruity aroma. Spices in the finish include sweet orange peel and coriander. Says serve at 38 to 42 degrees Fahrenheit or 3 to 6 degrees Celsius. So I think it's time to try it. Uh, if you want to pop her open there, we'll do that. Well, and if you're going to we'll, force my hand, we'll sir. finish out with the uh, with the bushmills. So. Oh, that was working. That was working big time. So. So while uh, while he's pouring that, I wanted to ask you, um, uh, Jack. You brought in some uh, some currency, and what uh, I'm, I was a little surprised by that. What is that yeah. about? So uh, basically, up the north coast of Ireland, uh, we use a different style of currency. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of our banks that we have up in the north coast of Ireland decided to do something pretty special for us. So what I brought along today was one of our old five pound notes, one of our new five pound notes, one of our new ten pound notes. Okay. Now. One thing I love explaining is on the back of your American dollar, well, particularly your $20 bill, mm-hmm. uh, you've got the White House. Yes. The White House is probably one of the most recognizable buildings anywhere in the world. Sure. Mm-hmm. One of the most powerful landmarks anywhere in the world. And one of the most powerful symbols within the United States. Mm-hmm. Now, what our national bank decided to do <laughs> is because we were 411 years old, and that birthday is on the 20th of April, f- at 1608. Well, I'll let you... Confirm exactly what is printed. Oh, on. so it's the old Bushmills Distillery, right on the back of every one of these notes. Every Ian, show that to the one of uh, our notes. Show that show that to the calendar. That's now great. that is something awesome. Yeah, and to you be gotta proud love, you gotta love that. We'll put that see? right there in front yeah. of the camera. See if I can get. See, it I think that American. Uh, I think that Americans are, are maybe a little too prudish to go with that. Like like we would never have put a uh, distillery on our currency because there'd have been too many that would have you know would have had issue with that like we were promoting you know drinking you know like that nick jonas guy that promotes cigar smoking you know we were, can you uh, believe that yeah you know it's, it's it's that kind of a that kind of a thing so so i think we're too brutish you to have, have to done listen that. to a couple of our episodes to understand yeah. why we're talking about that <laughs> yeah why are they talking about nick jonas everything just like <laughs> the universe just spun on the taxes um but uh, but anyway, we are. Uh, I think we're. I think we're too prudish for that. I love that the Irish are not. They just Agreed. go for it. Agreed. They just go for it. This, so, Ian, uh, tell me what you're getting on the nose. Of this, this smells exactly like it's described. Yeah, it smells like the White coriander, coriander is really really big in yeah. this. And coriander is a funny thing in beer because sometimes I like it, sometimes I don't. I don't know if it's a mood thing for me or if it's a this I beer or that beer thing for me. This, um, well, I'd be interested to see what you say. I have a, I have a thought to share. Yeah, I'm on the fence. I don't know if I like it. I like what it does. I like there's a banana thing on the end of this mm-hmm. that's really happening. And it's almost, it's got so much baking spice on my palate that it's almost like actually biting into a piece of bread, like a piece of... You know, you heavily floured bread or like an Irish. Uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, definitely a, bready a bread. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. What do you call? What do you call the Irish bread? Is, 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 are you just talking about soda bread? Yes, yes. yes that's what bread. that's what I'm talking about. Yes, uh, it reminds me a bit of that. Just very floury and baking spice. 
uh, heavy, but I don't. There's I don't a there's a it. there's kind of a coriander weird funk at the beginning of the flavor on this that I'm not sure that I jive with, but I like everything that happens after, after that. that. Yes, including some almost like citrusy fruit at the very end is what I'm uh, yeah. getting, which that surprises me a lot. This is this is very banana bomb to me, Jack. What do you think of this? Is this how does well, this strike your Irish? Well, for palate? me, like coriander definitely. On the on the front, so it's almost mm-hmm. as if you're in a kitchen. Yeah. Then for me, it's it's just complete banana bread for about what, <laughs> three, four, five seconds, and then it's weird that citrus note. But now it's like a, it's a ripe citrus. It's not that bitter mm-hmm. citrus, mm-hmm. just at the back. But then almost an overripe kind of, not in a bad way. Yeah, just yeah. slightly. Yeah. But I'm I'm getting a lot of chewiness though, like even though yes, put the beard, yes. I'm still mm-hmm. you know salivating, still chewing. Mm-hmm. It's. It's an interesting beer. Well, interesting. I've never had an imperial white ale before. <laughs> you know, this is a first because usually white ales are much lighter and much, uh, you know, much more on the, you know, you think of a blue moon type uh, consistency to uh, to what you're expecting well, from a white. White. Or, or like, like I think of a great example of white is the... It's the white buffalo from... Um, great white buffalo great from... Bu- from uh, buffalo... Uh, uh, what I'm am I thinking on of? it. Buffalo Bayou. Uh, from Buffalo Bayou, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean their white is just spectacular. And uh but that's uh that's kind of what I think of this is much different from that. I think I think devil is a good thing in the name because like as much as I'm not entirely sure that I like the beginning of this palette on this, it's sitting I on can't your shoulder. Stop drinking it. It's sitting on your shoulder going, Try more, <laughs> try more. <laughs> like it's a little weird. It's like that it's mm-hmm. like, you know, I don't. I don't know. It's 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 a funky flavor that I'm not entirely sure I like, but I keep drinking it. It's and like I I feel strongly there's there's more in there than what we've even described. I think it's you're like right. We've we've hit the skin, but we know there's more underneath there. <laughs> it's like you're trying to figure out what else is there. It's like when you get a really great dish from a chef and you're trying to deconstruct it in your brain and in your uh, taste buds and and try to figure out what is in this. Uh, yeah, yeah, I I, I agree. Um, I'm going to go on the record saying I like it, but I like it because of what it does after the first blush. Yeah. Uh, but I like that enough that I'm going to say I like it. it. It sends me, as you were saying, back to it, even though I don't like the first flavor quite as much as I like what it does once you've swallowed. Yeah. I, I, for me, this is a beer I'd definitely go for. If I seen if I could get a tasting board, mm-hmm. you know, if I only had to commit to you about, what, four ounces? Mm-hmm. This is definitely a beer I'd definitely be interested in. Committing to a full pour, I think, <laughs> might be a little bit too much for me. But yeah. on, the, on the tasting side, phenomenal. Yeah, so I, I like a lot of things about this beer that aren't necessarily the beer. I love the conversation that this beer creates. Like that mm-hmm. to me, Half and that's a beautiful, beautiful thing about a beer that can mm-hmm. create this much conversation just about it. Uh, I think that's an amazing thing. Um, I'm not really keen on the initial flavors, but I'm not a big fan of coriander and beer in the first place. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so you could take that as here or there. I just am not a huge fan of it. Um, I like the banana bread side of this. Mm-hmm. I'm willing to bet that if you sat down with some beer bread or something like that and a lot of butter, this would be a pretty amazing thing mm-hmm. on the side with it. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, I think that in the right situation, this could be a really, really amazing complement to food. I don't think a cigar would go with this at all. I think, no, I don't think so. I think that would be a travesty. Um, I, so. I, I kind of like the beer because, like I said, I, as much as I'm like, eh, I'm not sure I like it, I keep drinking it. I can't stop drinking it. So, so I almost wonder, as we go now back to uh, the Bushmills, uh, uh, the 16 and the 21, do you feel like we should do a palate cleanse before we get there? You think? Yeah, all right. I, 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 I think I think that might be it's a smart idea. All right. So uh, I don't know what you have, uh, Ian. If you have something over there, I have there, a shiner can, here. That's I have a sh- I'll, I'll do shiner as well. Shiner's, I'll a, do. shiner's a great palate cleanse. So oh. mm. we can. Uh, do you want? And, I have some of this guten tag left if you'd like. Uh, uh, oh, here. Don't worry. I've, yeah. got, I've got the water oh, here. You got water. I as well. Okay. I had it. Right. I mean, there's okay. water in beer, right? Oh well, yeah. Right. That's that's what <laughs> that's what I keep saying. Drink more water. I'm like, I I am, I am. Mm-hmm. I've had two Heinekens now. I just no. like flavor with a little I haven't alcohol. Had Heineken. Uh, sorry. Heineken. Uh, all right, let's Did jump you into say Heineken. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was trying to see if you were still with me over there. Uh, so we're going to jump into the Bushmills Single Malt 16, and this is uh, obviously. Uh, for a whiskey to be um, labeled as 16 means the 
the youngest whiskey in this is 16 years old. So and that, that's, and that's, that's been big, resting for a while. And remember, that's minimum. Right, right. Like, we're using older whiskey than this. Because mm-hmm. again, to balance out flavor, to balance out, balance out that consistency. Mm-hmm. Well, we have to use older whiskey to get it right. So everything inside this, is, it's what we call a three-wood whiskey. Mm-hmm. So it's a minimum 16 years inside bourbon. At the same time, we've got whiskey for a minimum 16 years inside sherry. So probably, like, visually, this helps explain. So this is the sherry cask. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is the right bourbon here, barrel. Yeah. Now, you can see the difference. Mm-hmm. The bourbon barrel is heavily charred. The sherry cask is not. It's toasted. Mm. But then we take these two 16-year-old whiskeys together. We marry them. Remember, marriage is bringing together two of, this, of the same style of whiskey. Right. Two of the same single malts. And then what we do, see that beautiful little pink piece mm-hmm. of wood over there? This one here? Yep. This is the port wine pipe that we use oh, okay. to finish it. Now, we finish it for at least six months. So again, the viewers can definitely just see mm-hmm. just that color change. And for those of you just listening, Josh, yeah, it's, it's pink. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's distinctive. <laughs> it's not subtle. Uh, but, um, so, so this gives us uh, the sort of richness of flavor that you're going for in this particular. See, I can see, I don't know if you were supposed to say or not, yeah. but I can see in your face, this is your favorite. This is my favorite. Like, whenever I was told I was able to go onto a show where cigars are being talked about, right, fine right. whiskeys mm-hmm. and good beer. Wow. Th- th- this is what a pain for a day, oh, right? I know. I know. <laughs> I know. What, what a pain for today, like today. So, right, look well, at I'm the color change. This. Yeah, the yeah. color on that I'm, I, is just amazing. Remember, not, Here, I'll hold one up. But even if you hold the 10 up as a comparison. Wow. See. Yeah. Yeah, the color change is just so that's not beautiful. Be- that's not because of age. That's because of that port That's wine the pipe finish. Port wine. Mm-hmm. So again, we'll let you kick off with the honors. Such a great sound. Such a great sound. Oh, you got it over there. Okay, cool. Yep. All right. So How the sixteen. You... No, that's going to be complex. Remember, with a bourbon barrel, you're pouring bass. You're yeah. going to get your caramelization. With a sherry cask, you're going to get your dried fruit, your nuttiness. Mm-hmm. With a port, you're going to get a little bit of. Uh, a berry jam almost. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's a sweetness on the nose to this that we haven't encountered yet, and it's it's like when you said jam, that kind of <coughs> that kind of jives with what kind I was brought thinking. it home, didn't it? Yeah. But uh, yeah, this has a lot sweeter smell overall than than the rest of them, and uh, you can still kind of smell that creamy butteriness in there as well. And wow, look at how it sticks to the glass. Yeah, the legs mm-hmm. night. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's Day of. So remember, as it's got a lot of oil in wow, it. Wow! Yes, as, as it we even, mature, it, you can even detect the oil on the nose. That there's, that it's a little, uh, it's a little, uh, a little bit of that oily consistency. Well, for those for those of you out there who don't know what we're talking about when we talk about the oily consistency, which is it's kind of a weird word when you're talking about whiskey if you're not into whiskey. But what the oily uh, oiliness does is. When it hits your tongue, it really spreads it across the palate, and it stays in your palate a little longer. So that's that's one of the things, and it also gives it kind of a silky kind of feel to it as well. I so totally right now want to light up an AJ Fernandez Bella Artes. Oh, be nice. oh uh, you, you, you've this. had a sip then, have you? Yes, I yes, have. I have. Yeah. Yes, and yeah. it's uh, it's wonderful. It really is. But you're so right. This because of I don't know if it's the the sherry, the port. I don't know. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's there's the marriage of all three. Something that it puts on your palate that just says, "Oh, this would go so nicely uh, with a good, complex, medium, medium, full-bodied cigar." The flavor and the retrohale on this is so incredibly pleasant and complex mm-hmm. at the same time. There's so many things going on with it. Um, it's uh, w- what I call the afterglow. Because it's about 20, mm-hmm. 30 second delay. Yes. yes. Because you get the body coming into the chest, which is there's a. But, See there, we neck, can, and, ch- yeah, see, right neck there, and chest, right there. We call that the whiskey hug. Yes, the and, whiskey hug, and it's awkward. It can get awkward. It here. can get awkward. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's uh, but it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> this uh, so there's a there's a grapiness in the uh, in the aftertaste yes, there is. to this that has now just been introduced, and I'm assuming that's that that uh, that wine cask that makes that big difference mm. uh it's really interesting how that comes through and i'm amazed at how it comes through with all the other things that are happening with this mm-hmm. yeah there's uh there's a spice um kind of thing going on as well that happens it's it's the timeline on this when you take a sip is very interesting well it is because you get um 
and immediately, like off the front, you get a sort of a uh, what I want to say is you get a sort of a whiskey vibe. Yeah. Uh, but but what I mean is like you're like ah oh, yes, I'm having a good whiskey, and then here comes the fruitiness and the the fruit- the, the cask. Uh, the, the flavors that the but cast the fruit imparts, gets yeah. darker. It's it's almost mm-hmm. like you know when you take uh, you talk about like fresh peaches have a certain vibe and a certain smell and and uh, fresh apple and all that stuff. But it's a difference when you put it into a pie and it's warmed up and it's got some of the cinnamon bacon spices and stuff in it. It has a different thing. This has a little bit of that kind of vibe to it as well, like mm-hmm. um, or even a maybe over ripeness in a fruit that um, that the the fruit character has changed. But this, it's still there. This has that vibe that makes me think you'd agree to do things you might not normally do when you were just leaning back and enjoying Hold this. my whiskey watch. Yes, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. I got an idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, honey? You want to buy what? Sure, go for it. <laughs> do, not, do not drink this and shop on the internet. <laughs> oh, no. No, that, that, it should come with that warning somewhere. Uh, yeah, Chris, Chris is making the face back there. She's like, "Oh, I've been yeah. there." Right under, <laughs> right under sixteen oh eight. That's what it should say. Do not drink this and shop on the internet. Right. Well, government, like, where did, government where, warning. Where did these packages come from? Uh, well, that's so that's spectacular. You can and lose it, yourself in this. Though. It's so complex. Yeah. Yes, and it, so it has me really wondering. Then what happens when you go to the twenty one? So th- this is where things really change up. So okay. typically, a lot of people would agree. From anywhere by 18 to 20 years, this is where whiskey changes. So look, with the 16, everything was vibrant. Everything was like mm-hmm. straight away. And so many flavors trying to shout to be who's the loudest. You have to look for anything because every flavor is it, trying to get all, your attention. Yes, yeah. it's all definitely clamoring. Now, this, let, me, let me clarify what he's saying. Up until that 18 you're talking about, 18 mm-hmm. years, the whiskey gets smoother, but the flavors are still very prominent. Mm-hmm. So after that, what he's talking about, um, yeah, like things begin to s- slow down, things become to mellow out, become subtle, become gentle. And the only way to discover into that category of whiskey, into that style of whiskey, into past 18, 20 years, is time. There's nothing else that can speed up or highlight any flavor apart from time. This is the only thing that will let you discover what is happening within okay. there. So. Again, I'll let you do the honors. Right. I'll uh, I'll do, I'll do the cork even, and it is. I like the little, sc- I like the little scrunchy nice. sounds when you're kind of like yeah, that little the, squeaky uh-huh. squeaky. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> these are all these are all sounds that play pleasantly in my mind. Sometimes when I'm trying to go to sleep at night, you know, if I can't uh, instead of counting can't sheep, fall asleep or don't want to count <laughs> sheep, I'll just uh, in my mind I'll hear squeaky squeaky. You know. Uh, it's either the dog finding a dog toy or it's the cork on the uh, <laughs> thank uh, you sir on the uh, bushmills so oh wow so like this is the, the nose this is the 21 is so immediately different on this yes. oh. it's so immediately buttery like the the probably the biggest difference between any of our whiskies is going to be between the 16 and the 21 and it's lo- so interesting because you can make the argument, okay, these are the best that you have, yeah. you know, in terms of the amount of time and effort and energy that's been spent in aging them and getting them to where they need to be. And you would expect them to almost be the two that would be the most similar. Yeah. Oh, now you were talking about the legs. Mm-hmm. Well, you should probably do Oh, yeah. This, yeah. You could actually use a spatula to get this off the side of the glass just about. That's yeah, and that's but it smells so like that buttery creaminess is so there, mm. like you can smell that all day long. What does it say? Oh, it's the number on the yeah. So basically, because we we can't dictate how much of our twenty one year old whiskey will will meet our standards. Sometimes we bottle a lot, sometimes we bottle a little. So this is why we actually do bottling years. And uh, so I was just actually double checking it because in twenty sixteen I was actually working with the guys who were up in the warehouses. I was in the picking crews working under Helmel Holland, who created wow. the recipe list. And then Alex Thomas, in charge of the maturation department, who then tells us what team is going to what warehouse to pick out the barrels. Hmm. So in 2016, I was involved in the crews that actually put together the 21-year-old. 2018, well, I was, I was in the United States by then. But, um, yeah, I mean, this, this highlights just how much of a family Bushmills is. It's not down to one person. It's the entire family of Bushmills that makes Bushmills possible. Mm-hmm. I just want to talk about how different this is. First off, butter. Second off, a little salt. And third off, chocolate. 
Like there, there is, is chocolate some, here. Yes, there is chocolate in the back of this. That like especially on a retro hill, it's so. And it's kind of somewhat in between malt and chocolate, if you know the difference between the two flavors. And it is so prevalent, and this is so delicate and delicious. Like this, if you've ever had like a really, really well done chocolate mousse versus, you know, a crappy, like I just got it out of the freezer section chocolate mousse, this is that top end of like that kind of creamy, smooth. I think that's a great whiskey. way to say yeah. it. It's, it's kind of like the difference between, you know, um, uh, whipping cream and the whipped cream and the, uh, I, you know. I was not expecting the chocolate to come through like no. that. That's huge. And a bigger one. See, as soon as you take a little sip, mm. let, it, let it just work its way down normally. But after it does, take a deep breath of air. And suddenly those subtle flavors become a lot more vibrant. And the tip of your tongue even starts to tingle. I just want to mention to, to those who are, you know, still with us here in the final segment of the show today, what... Jack is describing here is exactly the right way to experience whatever it is, whether it's the, a great 21 year old, you know, single malt Irish whiskey, or whether it's a cigar or whatever. When you can find the ability to just kind of sit back, go with it, and and let it let it simmer on your palate. I guess is the best way I can. Think of to say it. Just let, let it show itself. This is this is the joy and the beauty of why we like doing this. It's not about just drinking. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's it's about the enjoyment of this experience and you know, whether it's, you know, tasting the Guten Tag or the White Ale or whether it's getting into um, some of these expressions that have so much subtlety them yeah. to them. It's the the beautiful moment where you're just kind of letting it wash over you. That's why we do this. You know? What is the price point on that 21? So I believe in the state of Texas, it's just over $200. Okay. Um, but don't be afraid to go around the, the little mom and pop stores as well. Yeah. What about, want, the, what about the 16? 16 is about in around about $90. Okay. I so, want to point something out. At that $200, this 21-year-old is not only a bottle that you could have on your shelf and brag about, but... That seems an outlandish price for a whiskey for some people, but this, like, I'm still, yeah, I, I didn't have a lot to begin with, and I'm still tasting you're not my gonna, first few yeah, sips right now. I'm you're still not going to knock this back quickly. I'm still yeah. experiencing this, mm -hmm. so I've got an even bigger thing to bring out of the out of the cards. This scored the exact same points as Poppy Van Winkle 15. Wow, the, <laughs> this is so complex and beautiful, and I imagine this like this sounds crazy, but I would love to have a side of. A great vanilla ice cream with this. Oh yes! Like, not pour one over the other or anything like that. But if you just finished a vanilla ice cream, or and with maybe with some pecans, like those kind of things, and then this to finish it off. Oh man! Like amazing. We yeah. Uh, whenever we did a tasting in New York City, and we actually got one of the chocolatiers within the city to actually commission. A little bit of mint and orange infused uh, high percentage dark chocolate mm -hmm. cocoa. Yeah. Uh, and w what we did is that we, you know, we just crumbled it up in little bites. So some some were more minty, some were more orange. So you didn't know what you were getting. So every single one you were biting into, sometimes one flavor stood out more than the other. Because it, see if you go back to nosing it. Well, it's it's fun to play with the palate like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, the orange, it's not distinctive, but once you recognize the orange, and what yeah. I mean by that, it's orange peeled. You know whenever yes. you peel the zest, an orange, yeah. airborne zestiness. It's faint, but it's there. And look, we're doing the exact same. And I think if anyone's watching, we'll see the body language straight away between all three yeah. of us. Oh, this is has radically changed. Oh yeah, it, 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 I'm so chilled out here. I'm like, man, just, this, this, let's just take the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> you know what I mean? You want to speak more slowly. Oh, yeah. It leaves such an interesting, like you know, when you use um, when you use a, a, um, a chapstick or something on your lips that leaves a little bit of that minty kind of coolness on your lips it leaves a little bit of that on your lips as well which is really interesting do you also notice every sip you take you recognize something different it's yeah this is so complex and so fun like this is as crazy as it sounds this is one of the most fun whiskeys i think i've tried because there's so many different things happening mm -hmm. on it it's, and uh, and yet as much as i love it i almost find myself being drawn back to the 16. yeah See, th this is 16. This is where uh, you know, until I tried this, I would have said my the 16 is my absolute favorite. Yeah. 
I'd have to go back to 16, but I destroyed mine, so we'll do that, <laughs> well, after, we'll do that after the show. Yeah, I'm sure I, have, we could I have a feeling I know where you may be able to <laughs> get some more. It's going to be a more. post-show experiment. Well, but, look, Jack, uh, tell me why, and, and I'm going to ask this question carefully because, I mean, absolutely no offense in any way when I ask this. Why isn't Bushmills a more widely like loved respected name like when you when you start talking whiskey among whiskey connoisseurs you're not as likely to hear them bring up bushmills and based on what no. I, what we've tasted today they should be and do, do you know do you know what it is we've been we've been forgotten about is because you've been here for so long we've over been, familiar yeah. yeah and you know in recent years we followed a very you know strict style of whiskey style of whiskey mm -hmm. expressions now we've recently just started to, you know, flex our muscles, let yeah. our wings fly. I mean, in in the distillery, we've got a distillery exclusive where we've got a whiskey finished inside acacia wood, um, which is forty seven percent non chill filtered. We've got Caribbean rum cask available in the airport duty free. Love that. Oh, man. Um, we've got, and we've also been like teasing a lot of people with like cask samples lately. Mm -hmm. you know, with like whether it's crystal malts, whether it's wine, whether it's mm -hmm. coin, there's little hints. We're just teasing everyone because big things are happening with Bushmills right now. I love it. And remember, I worked there for seven years. I've been in America now for two years. Now, you can't fake this smile whenever, <laughs> whenever I'm telling you. If you like Bushmills now, we're only just starting. Well, I I would really encourage anyone who thinks of it as you know, like an old brand that's not as interesting, that's not as complex. You really need to rethink that perception based on what we've tasted how, today. How long have these uh, expressions been available? Now, you talked about the um, the four-year, the red, mm -hmm. that was a reasonably new expression. Yeah, so that's uh, that's been 2016. Okay. Original's been 1888. Obviously, right. 2016, 1888, just a couple yeah, years. Yeah, there's a couple years. Yeah, a couple years, years yeah. It's then 1898. From the Black Bush. Yeah, this, no, the 10-year as we see it today, we've had the 10-year for o over 100 years. Okay. Right. But the 10 years we see it today is from 1981. Okay. This only appeared in the market in 1997. So the, the in 16 is really pretty new, and then the Bushmills 21 rare is very new. But remember, that took us decades upon decades to find out why do we do a six month finish? Why do we do a 16 year not when most people do a 15 year or an 18 year? We I did mean, 16 because that suited Bushmills. I can't imagine the patience that it takes oh, to work man. on you're that. So right. they, yeah, we, you're so we've, right. We've had master distillers where, and master blenders where their initial work, they unfortunately passed away before they seen what their initial work was like. Right. And this is what I mean. Bushmills is different to any other brand because we, learn things from our predecessor and we have to admit and we have to be prepared that our work that we're doing now we'll never see the fruits of our labor wow. Wow, and this so is the thing this is why we lasted 411 years <laughs> so. well i have to tell you your newest expressions are i've had the black bush before and i think it's it's a great great whiskey i've never had the 10 the red the 16 or the 21 I will tell you, if I had to pick one desert island out of all these, the 16 would probably be my desert island, although the 21... 21 tough to argue with, though. Yeah. The, the, and I'll tell you the biggest reason that I would choose the 16 over 21 is the 16 would stand up to a cigar. Yes. It would stand up to a lot of things where the 21 is so delicate that you literally just want to sit. Mm -hmm. and, and even if it's just an internal... Uh, monologue. Uh, you really want to kind of sit down and you'd pontificate want, on it. Yeah, you know? you'd want to contemplate. <laughs> I don't something. care if anyone's listening. Yeah, you want to talk. About you'd this. want to contemplate something pretty and it's important. It's amazing. You know, like where does your lap go when you stand up? That is true. That right? is true. That is the kind of thing that you could sit down with a, a glass of the twenty-one and think about that for a long time, and come away pretty pleased with yourself mm -hmm. for what you had uh, discerned. Well, uh, Jack, I want to thank you so much. Thank Jack you for Ferris that absurdity, is the, by the way. Uh, yeah, you know, I was like, okay, we better end the show. Uh, 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 this has been a, a great deal of fun. Thank you for bringing such a wide range of expressions. This has been uh, a great deal of fun, and thanks for tasting the beers with us. And um, I'm, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm a fan. This is terrific. Well, Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I mean, guys, it's been a great deal of fun. 
And I don't think we could could have got better weather for being oh. stuck inside. I'm particularly yeah. having the curtains open so we can be a little bit more smug just yeah. watching <laughs> yeah. that rain pour down. Absolutely. And so. about the time we got to the 16, I was like, this is this is perfect. Yeah, yeah this is just <laughs> perfect. Well, uh, thank you again for uh, Cheers, guys. Uh, being on the program. When you are back in uh, Cheers. the uh, Cheers. southern Cheers. area of the U.S., please look us up. We'd love to hang a drink with you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, checking out the show, number 162, on our next program, 163. We will welcome back uh, show favorite friend of the program, Mark Burrell. Mark was... Uh, uh, supposed to well, it, it certainly wasn't his fault. The last time we had we Mark derailed on, him. Yeah, we were on at the uh, Rainbow Lodge, and Mark was uh, was supposed to bring us some uh, suggestions for wine for the holidays, and then we started drinking Treaty Oak, and and yeah, we derailed was, the whole thing. We derailed the whole and thing. And he was so Never. graceful and awesome. Oh, oh too, you know, but, he yeah. is. He's like he's like the the consummate host. So uh, we will have Mark back on the studio in the studio next week with us, and we'll be talking about wine for your holiday parties. So I think this is important. We don't don't do a lot of wine shows here, uh, but I think it'll be important to allow Mark to uh, to show us what we need to know, to uh, preach to us a little bit about wine for the holidays. Because if you're doing a holiday party, you gotta you got to be able to buy the right wine. And yes. don't forget, if you uh, miss a part of the show or all of it, you can see us uh, on YouTube. You can listen to us on any of the podcast yeah, That's right. If you're on YouTube, though, make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you hit the share button. Make sure you hit the little bell to let you know when we post new content. Absolutely. If you've seen it before... Watch it again. And last but not least, if you're going, uh, if you're stocking up for your holiday parties, buy some Red Bush because that's what you're going to want to pour for your uh, your friends at the party, and then buy some 16 because that's what you're going to want to have after your friends have gone <laughs> and you're sitting alone at the party. doing that. And my wife and I do this. I know your wife and you must do it as well. Uh, that thing at the end of the party where you go, all right, let's get something to drink, and sit and talk about what happened at the party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's the best. The party, uh, the cool down, the cool down. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll take it. Uh, have a great week my friends thank you all for uh, being a part of smoking and toasting thank you especially to those of you who came out uh, for the whiskey sniff have a wonderful week and we'll see you awesome. next thursday cheers cheers ah, ah!